First of all, I'll give a short talk, uh, probably about 15 or 20 minutes, on uh, Orsonium, which I've been investigating recently. Um, <clears throat> has anyone heard of it? Maybe. <laughs> cool. uh, has anyone ever, ever thought of like, implementing uh, a web UI in their game, if, if their game wasn't like an actual an HTML app or something like that? Uh, yeah. Yeah? Um, I was downloading um, uh, you know, web pages and wondering mm -hmm. if it represented you know, the engine. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That's an interesting thing. Yeah. Um, a lot of material out there you can leverage. Yeah. <laughs> the old Oregon train game actually uses HTML to render its UI. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah well, I've actually you know, worked at a few companies who have built a HTML. I've, I've actually done it myself a few times, built like a, a simplified HTML render. Um, I've also worked at companies that have used uh, Flash. To build the UI, which is which is pretty pretty similar in a lot of ways. Um, Orsonium is a package that lets you build a web UI basically, and so that's what I'm going to talk about. So what is it? <clears throat> well, it, it's basically a, a bridge for building web UIs in native applications. It's it's kind of specifically aimed at building web UIs in games as well. It's not generally you can use it to you know to build a web browser if you wanted to, but it's specifically aimed at, at games. It's a Windows wrapper uh, Chromium uh, WebKit. Um, it's actually there's a few different I mean it's open source, WebKit is open source and, and there's a few different wrappers for it uh, that are open source. Also is actually a, a, a commercial product. So it's, it's, it's really quite simple, like the way it works, uh, internally the way it works is pretty, I imagine, pretty complicated, like it probably take you uh, several months to get WebKit up, up to the level of functionality that Orsonium provides. Basically what it does is basically it, it renders the UI to the texture, and then what you do with that texture is up to you. So you can basically render it as like a full screen quad, or you can, you can, have, you can put it on a 3D mesh and, and have a sort of 3D UI. That could be interesting. <laughs> so you display your texture on the screen. Um, the API has got special functions for piping in keyboard and, and mouse input and controlling the focus, the input focus. I thought I'd just show some examples because I don't, I don't really have a good example to show. Um, I, I have a really basic example to show, but um, people are starting to use it. And I think it's you know building web UIs and games is going to become a lot more common. Um, often, you, if, if you've worked with this kind of thing before, or you've built flash UIs for games, you'll know how, how good you can make the game look with it, and how much freedom you can give to the artists and the designers. Uh, but if, if you're not familiar with that, maybe you're just thinking of like you know, a web page in, in a game, and maybe you're limited by your imagination, so I'll just show you some examples. Hopefully they've downloaded. This is a really simple one. Uh, So all this stuff was done in Web UI, basically. It's, it's not like overlap some 2D asteroids game. It's not particularly exciting, but it, it, you know, it, it gives you an idea of where you can get to sort of almost, almost immediately using like um, open source technologies like an open source web APIs. There's this one called um, Overgrowth, which is it's kind of like, this is like the editing environment for this, this game that this, these guys are creating. And, and it's all done using um, Orsonium, Web UI. So all the 2D stuff that you see like rendered over the top basically is, is Orsonium. I'll leave it that, uh, that one. Um, but as an example of, of, of like a web app that's more like an app application, I found this. I mean, you can see plenty of this sort of stuff around. You guys have seen things like this. That you know, this is a drawing app. It's all done in HTML5. It's got menus. You know, so you can, you can do some pretty interesting UIs 
apply in, in web applications these days. I think uh, yeah, you can just close these win windows. You can, even, you can drag them around, put them where you want. So there's plenty of examples of this sort of stuff on the internet. Um, this is an example of some 3D thing where you can sort of generate some organic looking geometry. I think it's using, I think it's using WebGL. Basically, you can, I don't know how fast this is, but you can, you can play with the size and the shape and various aspects of this. I thought something interesting that I found. <coughs> anyway, so that's a few examples. Uh, I'll move on. Uh, platforms that it supports. So it supports Windows, uh, Mac OS, X, uh, Linux, graphic APIs. Um, it pretty much supports anything just by virtue that you're, you're just getting pixel data out of it and as a texture. But you know, it's, people have used it with OpenGL, DirectX, WPF, XNA. The, for, for various APIs, there's, there's like wrappers, open source wrappers that help you use it for that API as well. So uh, it's got the APIs in C and C++, so there's two separate APIs there. Uh, C Sharp as well. Um, Unity, but unfortunately Pro Unity only because it's a plugin. And it's a plugin for Unity on, on, on Windows and on Mac. But you, you, it doesn't work with the free version, unfortunately. No mobile support yet. But then again, you might not want to use it. Uh, I see this as being very useful for, for, for big applications, really, uh, you know, with complicated UIs, um, like you know, the, like you saw before in that in that example with the, the kind of rabbit creatures running around. That that was more of an, a game editing environment, and when they when they switch into the actual game, the, the UI one, it's a much less. Uh, so why would you want to use a web UI? Uh, well, you can make use of the latest web technologies and they're, they're pretty sophisticated these days and there's lots of APIs and frameworks that help you put together an application which results in less work. Uh, one thing I really liked about it, like as opposed to using Flash, is that programmers can easily build UIs themselves even if they don't, they don't look that Flash because then you can basically, you know, you can contract that work out to a, a web designer and have them make it look beautiful. Uh, it's, it's really fast. Um, you, you can set up an environment so that your UI runs in Chrome as well as in your game. So it, it's basically just a case of like editing the HTML and the JavaScript and then F5 in, in, in Chrome. And then you can do rapid iteration that way and then every so often you, you try it again in, in game. Uh, and there's various ways you could, you could use to actually connect up Chrome to your game. So you, you, you can effectively be rem remote controlling your game from Chrome. The other alternative would be to have um, some test data. So you have a whole bunch of test data that you've generated maybe from the real game and that's backing up your UI. So it's incredibly customizable. Um, there's lots of third party tools and APIs and UI prototyping tools and theme builders and stuff on the internet. I, these days basically it's not a choice between, you know, should I should I write my own code and roll it myself or, or use one of the ones that are out there, it's like which one of the ones out there should I use because there's so many, there's so many good options. <coughs> so let's talk about some of the, the costs of using this. Um, it, it will be harder to debug your UI because it's going to effectively running in a separate process to the application and the, the communication between them. So Fortunately, uh, Chrome's got a really good debugger, so that, that will make it easier somewhat, but still, you won't be able to get in, in a native application, you can't easily go and just step into what the UI code is doing. <coughs> you have to, maybe this is a good thing as well, and I, I think I mentioned this in my benefits slide, um, you are forced to build a better design for your UI framework and how it interacts with your game engine, because they're, they're in separate processes and the communication costs and the communication overhead is there and you've got to manage that. So you've got to, you've got to think more a lot about how you design it, which you, you wouldn't necessarily have to do. Um, you have to think differently about it as well um, to how you would normally build a UI in a native application. The developers have to be proficient at web technologies. So, uh, I mean, 
the good thing about that is there, there is a lot of people out there that are proficient in that, and there's a lot of resources to learn it. But if you don't currently have those guys like in, in your company, then they have to learn it. Um, it's still early days with, this, with Orsonium, and the API appears to be uh, evolving. It, from reading forums, it looks like there's been a few cases where people have had their code broken by, by API changes. The good thing about that, though, is that the, it, it does appear to be evolving towards something that's easier to use rather than something that's sort of rather obscure. What's the API like? Well, what's the... It's really easy. I'll, I'll give you a demo. I'll show you some code at the end. So benefits. Um, so the the flip side of having to think more about your design and, and having to figure that out is that you probably will end up with a better design, better design interface between the game and the UI, and they'll be less dependent on each other. Um, what that might lead to is it, it'll be more work, but you you you'll gain you'll you'll have a faster development cycle building the UI, so you hopefully gain that back. Um, but you're in this situation at the end where you can take this UI off and possibly replace it with something else, as long as you've defined the, um, the communication between them in the right way. I was thinking about MVC to the extreme. So, you know, your, uh, your view can basically be thought of as a view on the model, which is something that's actually in the, in the engine itself. <clears throat> So one thing I really like is that it's, it's potentially scriptable and testable offline. So if you've got a well-designed messaging system, um, that in some ways you'd, you'd want to wrap it up and make it really sort of automated, uh, so that it's it's really transparent to the programmers and they don't have to worry about it too much. Uh, but if if you can have it passing messages back and forth, that's talking about the data that's going between the UI and the engine, and, and the actions that are happening between them, um, you can record that then to like a, a, a JSON data file. And effectively replay it so that your your whole UI is, is runnable offline with, with a sequence of you know maybe frame based data that, that's driving the UI. Uh, so it's 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 a cheap way of recording and testing user actions. And, um, I think there's a lot you could probably do with that. <clears throat> so it's really easy to get started with Osonium. I'll, I'll show you that in a sec. Uh, faster the dev cycle, so you iterate quickly developing your UI. Of course, you, before you can you can get to that stage, you have to have a decent, well-designed framework in place, and then the messaging system. There's no obviously no compilation when you're working with HTML and JavaScript. You just make a change, and and if you've got some auto update set up where the engine knows that they've changed, you can just refresh the UI. You can build, test, and debug in Chrome. Chrome's got a pretty, pretty good debugger for JavaScript. So I already mentioned this anyway, but uh, there's a wide range of third-party APIs and tools. There's almost too many, so sorting, sorting out the best ones can be difficult. But there's lots of, lots and lots of information out on the web about, about this sort of stuff. Um, one really good thing you can do is you can integrate UI and web content. They're, they're effectively one and the same thing. So if you want to have like a like a news stream or like a leaderboard or something that comes direct from the internet, it's just trivial trivial to implement that and, and bring that in. Uh, programmer initially builds the UI and you can contract it out to a web designer to make it look beautiful. You know the. As long as the web designer knows what they're doing and, and you've, put, you've got like a protocol in place of how the UI talks to the engine, then it can change you know, radically. You'd, you'd be surprised at how much they could re-engineer the UI if you've, got, if you've got that right sort of, if you've got that messaging protocol defined properly at the start. Uh, performance. So performance is a little bit of a problem. Um, it, it degrades as the resolution increases. I think it's probably mainly limited by fill rate. Um, uh, but, but there is basically a tiling solution which looks to be promising. Uh, basically, you just break the screen up into tiles, and also it already has the capability of telling you what what rec of the screen changed, and you, then you basically just re redraw the, the texture, the, the tile parts of the screen. So licensing, it's uh, it's, it's a really good deal for indies and um, non-commercial use. Uh, it's pretty pretty expensive, really, for a a commercial application, but you know, if, if you had to put in a couple of months worth of effort to actually achieve this anyway, um, it, it, it might be worth the cost to you.
So there is, as I mentioned at the start, there is a bunch of free alternatives. So, so WebKit itself is open source and you can build it and you can, you can do some stuff with it. Um, I think it's probably a long way from you know, being able to render the, the web page to a texture. But there is like PhantomJS, uh, Berkelium and, and Rocket, which are all, I think they're all open source and, and all in various varying stages of development. I haven't, I haven't tried any of them, but th these are things to watch in, in coming years. You know, they'll probably come up to where Orsonium's at pretty pretty quickly. And, and they do the same kind of thing. It's just like, give it a URL, and it will give you back a texture that's uh, of what's on there. <coughs> so how does it work? Um, we're going to through this really. Orsonium renders to a texture, and you store that texture on the screen. Uh, if you're in Unity, which is what I'm going to show you in a second, you need to use a GUI texture basically to get that texture onto the screen. Input, there's basically various functions for piping keyboard and mouse input into it. Uh, we're looking at, uh, I, I'm specifically looking at it from, from C Sharp in Unity. You get various functions basically from, from C Sharp in order to be able to like do stuff in the world of JavaScript you know, in terms of like creating global objects, um, setting properties on them, and, and just executing, generating and executing arbitrary JavaScript which is like one way of getting your data into that, into that world. Going from JavaScript back to C Sharp, um, there's a function to set an object callback. So what this does basically is it effectively allows you to define a JavaScript function, which when called from JavaScript actually executes a, a C Sharp function. So you, you can have uh, information coming back that way. One thing I was experimenting with, and I'm not sure that this is definitely the way to go yet, but is defining like one messaging function. So one, one sort of global function that you use to send a message with, with a, a JSON data payload back to the application to act on. And how do you implement that in, the, in C Sharp? Maybe it's like you've, you've registered objects, game objects with IDs, uh, and it, the message has references that object ID, so it, it finds it in a map, and maybe the message is named, and it just uses C-sharp reflection to actually call that, call a function that has the same name as the message, something like that. So json.net um, is a C-sharp library. Go ahead one. json.net is basically this, this API that will just take C-sharp objects and convert them to json.net. And it's just a it's just a really really simple way of getting your data out of C sharp into JavaScript, and then any data that needs to come back, it just gets deserialized to C sharp objects. So there's a couple of resources there. Uh, I'll put this online on the Meetup site, so you can look at that later if you want to. Um, and I'll just give you a demo in Unity. When you're um, creating a new scene, it's basically, once you've installed Orsonium, it's just a matter of, you know, when, when you're creating a new scene in Unity, or a new project, sorry, not a scene, you, you get a list of all the packages to import, like Orsonium's just in that list, so you check it, um, it gets imported into your scene, you get this Orsonium test scene automatically added to your project, uh, and it adds a couple of meshes, basically, that have uh, uh, these sort of web, web textures applied to them. So, for example, here you can actually set the URL. This one's set up to Google. So if you actually run this, you can you'll just see that the UI, the web UI basically appears in those. This scroll bar here is basically just rendered to a texture. So, and and I'm piping the input. Um, I mean, this is this isn't my code or anything. This is just what Orsonium gives you. 
uh, and it's piping the input. When, when it does a hit test against this, this object here in 3D space, and it uses that to figure out you know, what the coordinates are that you're clicking on, and it, and it pipes that through. And, and then it uh, also um, knows that you know, part of it or all of it has been, been dirty, and it gives you that information so you know how to, you know, you know it needs to be redrawn. That's a 3D sample. I mean, you can, you can see how that could be a little bit useful if you if you were wanting to do a 3D interface. Uh, what I was more interested in is actually doing like a full screen thing, which it doesn't really it doesn't really give you as as an example. So you have to go and mess around with the code a little bit. I mean, it only takes you like half an hour now to actually get something up and running. Uh, I, I made this this scene, simple scene with some terrain and trees, just so you can see the stuff there. Um, I've Mess with the script a bit. That's just the example script that comes with it. I'll, I'll show you that code in uh, Mono Development in a minute. I'll just run it. This, this, this example gives you like a full screen thing, so. What you need to do to turn this into like a proper game UI is really just to uh, enable transparency in the in, in also mean. And then you go into the to the CSS uh, background properties for the, for the background of the page. It doesn't seem to be working, but uh, that's supposed to be Google. You go into the, into the background um, style of your, your page and just set the background to transparent. And then any, anywhere where there's not actually UI elements like on in the in the web page, the rest of the 3D background and whatnot just shows through. Yeah, but it's only Google's. Oh, yeah. Okay. So this is running inside uh, inside Unity. I assume the delay is most of the network you're on now in the library and uh, the speed of. Mm. Yeah, this this bit here. I mean, that's. I mean, it's being it's being a little bit responsive, but it's just not. The network's not catching up. It actually uses it like the same way uh, Chrome does. It actually uses a separate process. So this will this will add, you know, a certain amount of overhead anyway to, to what you're doing. But, uh, you know, may, maybe maybe it will help. I mean, it, it it might really actually help you if you're always running on multiple machines, you know, off offloading a lot of the GUI work. Here we can look at this, uh, what the code looks like. So I've, I've just basically created a, a UI, a game object called UI. You add the GUI texture to it, uh, and then this is the script that actually sets up the, the web view and points to that uh, URL. So to make it, make it full screen, um, I mean this is a sample code that I've, I've modified and I tried to really not modify it very much, but just taking the width of the screen and the height there, creating a, a, a web view on that width and height, loading a URL which is initially set to Google. There's some code there that you need to enable to turn on the transparency stuff. Create a texture in which to actually get the data into. Now there's a, a few different options here. Uh, I, I think I think this code is executed if it's attached to like a 3D object or something. It's going to be a 3D UI. This is the code that we're interested in. Um, basically, it's it's in this line. It's extracting the, the GUI texture that's a, that's also attached to the game object. It's setting up the 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 width and the height of that GUI texture, so where it's basically rendered on screen. And it's the, the texture we created earlier, so this one up here. It's actually plugging that into the GUI texture as the, as the source of the data. There's a couple of event handles here for handling you know, different JavaScript events and then giving focus to the web view. 
So what, what's the data of using the GUI texture of the stamp? You could, you'd, um, if you wanted to render it manually, like you could implement, I think, on GUI, and, oh, okay. and, and just render the texture to the screen. But this this was just the way the sample code was set up. Yep. Uh, I don't know, you could render it that way. I thought you always had to go through on GUI. So. No, you just have to attach a GUI texture to your game object, and that will automatically render a texture where, where you sort of set it up on, on screen. You don't have to have any specific call to render it, it just, it just magically happens. I think there is an on GUI call in here somewhere. The most interesting other thing is the... Um, so there's, there's a call to if on GUI where it's doing... Um, injecting a mass movement event. And then we're calling this handle unity event function here, which is doing all the other... the injection of all the other types of input. I think there was a whole bunch of code that wasn't working full screen, so I commented it out. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, uh, that's all awesome. I mean. I thought that I thought it was pretty interesting and, and a pretty good way to build GUI, so I thought I'd do a short talk on it. What sort of um, uh, uses are you using it for? Oh, nothing yet. Okay. Yeah, just investigating it. Trying to figure out how to build. I think the main, the main problem is how to build the messaging framework to, to sync up your data that's in, in the front end with the data that's in the actual yearly application. Yeah, I was looking at it because I was, you know, uh, talking to a customer that was interested in getting some web pages, you know, inside of it. Mm. And then I was like, oh, you know, do I have to get a whole web kit in? And stop the cross So it never eventuated the job. But <laughs> <laughs> it work out. Yeah, I think, I think it's worth considering. Um, it's, it, the real reason I started looking at it was because the, the way you develop UIs in Unity is it's, it's simple and you know it, it, it's it's nice in some regards and, and it's easy to make UIs for simple games that just have you know a couple of hard elements and maybe a simple front end menu, but it it's really horrible when you start building really really complicated UIs, like really complicated UIs. Um, the the main reason I think is because it it jams all, all the all the UI logic and the rendering into the same code. Uh, it's I've, I've heard it's not, not very good for performance either. Uh, but, but I think that's, that's mainly um, for, for mobile phones, really, because it, it, it does a lot of draw calls, basically. I think, they're, they're, I think they're doing work in Unity 4 to, to put those draw calls into like a, I don't know, one draw call, batch that somehow. But There's a lot of third party um, UI software mm -hmm. you know, that uh, does stuff about us and so basically you, um, you set up and you want everything, and uh, they go bang and crack. Acting on the one texture set to only one state. But you know, one I used was called Easy GUI, and it was anything but. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was faster than the Unity one, but you know. Mm. There's another no one called NGUI or something as well. But, mm. um, then if it's HTML5 and CSS and you know, JavaScript. Mm. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you know, there's so much more. Like, good for the desktop, but maybe not for the mobile devices. Yeah, I mean, it's all for the tablet. No Look at the same thing in a few years. <laughs> yeah. 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 Every, everything seems to be going like, towards web UI, so I wouldn't be surprised if Orsonium or you know, its competitors implement this for like tap. Think about how powerful phones and tablets are going to be in coming years. So, yeah. It's, it's not a matter of how, how much performance your, is in your UI, it's a matter of how quickly you can build it, how nice it looks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and who else you can leverage in order to mm. uh, to help you build it? There's just so many, you know, uh, user interface APIs, and they're all different. It's like mm. you don't want to learn each and every one. Yeah. Mm. And as you said, you've got some mobiles sitting around anyway. So. Mm. Yeah, well, I, so for instance, I go to the JavaScript meetup group, and you know, there's a, like so there's a wealth of knowledge even in in Brisbane. You know, pe people you can talk to about how you know what to choose and, and how to how to go about building this sort of thing. It's not, it's not my background. Just dabble, I just dabble in it occasionally. Oh, thanks.
smash, it's good. The, um, uh, the cost of it, is that two and a half grand, is that like, it's commercial, is that you know, just a one-off fee for the business, or is that? It's per commercial product. Uh, okay. yeah, and then, uh, then there's no, apart from that, there's no strings attached. Yeah, so it's not like for you know, you know, you copy you sell mm -hmm. to a customer, it's it, one product you pay for it once and sell a thousand. It's completely free for uh, like evaluation and development. So yeah, I agree. If, if you didn't have a, like a, a product that was due for like a year or something, you, you, could, you could probably just start using it and, and see if you know, anything more viable comes along in the meantime. If you, if you structure your code appropriately, it, would, it, it wouldn't be a huge effort to change over. It sounds like a force to do that a bit anyway. Wait in half an hour.